Sean Bonner is someone who um, I kept running into online and I never met in real life. We retweet each other a bunch, reply to each other a bunch, and then finally just decided to have lunch one day and um, it turns out we have a ton of sort of like shared history and surprising that we haven't met before. We have a bunch of mutual friends. And um, he's doing stuff with radiation these days. Um, I think he's uh, creating some sort of superhero or superhero defense um, over in Japan. So he'll tell you all about that. I think <laughs> you have your visual aids? I got a couple of visual aids. He's got a couple of visual aids. Visual <coughs> aids. Okay, Sean Bond. So th I actually don't have a set like presentation thing for this because it's kind of brand new. So um, what I would have done is like had some sort of professional presentation that then I just didn't show and just talked. But I've never talked about this at all, so I'm kind of going to make it up along the way, and so expect lots of mistakes and random divergence that would be cut out on something that was more more professional, I guess. So uh, yeah, so like two months ago there was this earthquake in Japan, and um, you've probably heard about it stuff shock and stuff. And nothing really bad happened with the earthquake because um, Japan's like earthquake proof. Um, except then there was this big tsunami which was way bigger than everybody was expecting and, people, and Japan isn't really giant tsunami proof. Um, there's actually, it's sort of a side, a side rant, but there's actually um, all around the coast on, of Japan are these huge rocks that have these etchings in them. They're really old and, and I'm gonna get the translation wrong, but it sort of says, don't ever build shit below this or you'll die. And that's like, what, <laughs> like that's what, like everything below there is what got destroyed by the tsunamis. Um, everything above them is fine. Um, and they've been there forever. And I guess that, I guess they were like, ah, these are old, what do they know? You know, we don't have to worry about this. But yeah, there's these huge rocks and they're all around the coast and now everybody's like, oh, weird. Um, but anyway, there's a bunch of nuclear reactors below um, below those rocks that got hit by giant waves and have been causing all sorts of problems. So I have a bunch of friends in Japan who right away were like, okay, this is weird. Um, what do we do about this? And we started trading a bunch of emails to try to figure out, well, how do we actually find out what's going on since they're locking things down and the only numbers that are, that are being released on anything is by um, TEPCO, which is the Tokyo Electric and Power Company. And um, they don't really have a huge interest in reporting numbers that are above what they should be, um, as well as Greenpeace, who's releasing numbers, who doesn't really have an interest in reporting numbers that are below what they should be. Um, so with everything being like, well, I don't believe any of these numbers, and I don't really know where they're coming from, we were like, well, we're going to figure out how to get some real numbers. And at the same point, we got introduced to um, a handful of guys in Portland who were trying to figure out how to build a system where anybody could submit radiation tracking numbers from, from their own devices and uh, and then throw those all together somehow and, and get a little bit of a, a map that they could try to put something together. So we, we decided to combine forces with these guys, um, reach out to a bunch of Geiger counter builder people and see and see what we could do uh, to create a network of, of Geiger counters and, and things that were reading radiation all around in Japan. So we went and tried to buy a bunch of Geiger counters, um, but they were all gone because, like everybody in the Midwest of the U.S., like bought every Geiger counter. That <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like literally, like everybody who sells anything is like, I don't know, I got like a thousand orders for Ohio, so like we can't send anything to Japan. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and so we're like, okay, well that's that's a little bit of a hiccup in our plan there. So uh, we started searching around and um, and found. But well, we found two things. So we found um, that there's lots of surplus Geiger tubes all over the. So a Geiger counter is actually a, a stupidly simple thing to, thing to make. Um, and there's lots of there's lots of, of Geiger tubes around from uh, from Chernobyl, from Russia, um, which is weird because uh, the the Russian government actually made it illegal for uh, citizens to own Geiger counters right after things started happening. <laughs> because, you know, like, I'm sure, I'm sure they would just misread something and, you know, get, get worried about a bunch of stuff that, that they shouldn't. 
So there's a bunch of tubes. Um, most of the tubes don't work because they were all made in, in the 70s and 80s, and they were all in equipment and got used by stuff and, um, and used for years and years and years, and then somebody like salvaged them out and is trying to make top dollar. So you'll see these tubes all over the place that are glass and have like fancy caps on them and all this stuff, and none of those work. The only ones that are actually worth any good that are salvaged are these, um, you can't really see it in here. I'll pass this around in a second. But this is, um, so this is what we're calling an iGeigy. And it's a, a Geiger counter that plugs into an iPhone. And then we have a little piece of software that sort of keeps track of the counts that go through it and up, uploads it to our server. So with geo, a little bit of a geotag and stuff. And so, you know, like, okay, wherever this is, this is where the, the counter is happening and, and what's going on with it. And, uh, and it's pretty cool. So this, this tube that's in here is an old Russian, um, an old Russian tube, so I'll hand that out and pass it around. I'm not sticking my iPhone in it because I'm doing other shit without it at the moment, so sorry. You have to pretend that it would be counting something if it was in the front. But it works pretty cool. Um, so we got a bunch of those of those those tubes and uh, and started putting together random random devices like that and uh, some bigger ones that, that sort of are plugged into networks that people can stick outside their house and um, just a whole bunch of things that we could actually farm out to hackerspaces. I run a hackerspace here in Los Angeles called Crashbase, and I was working with a hackerspace in Tokyo called Tokyo Hackerspace. Um, and uh, we know a bunch of other hackerspaces around, so we, we put together some little PCBs um, with the really simple stuff that goes into what drives a, a Geiger counter, and so we're in the process of getting parts out to these people all over the place so they can sort of put them together and then ship them back or you know, do whatever they need to do with them to start tracking them. And then at the same time, we got in touch with this guy. Um, uh, his name is Dan. And he runs a company called International Medcom. And he, um, he helped design the sensor networks at Chernobyl and at Three Mile Island. So he sort of um, he knows a little bit about, about radiation and tracking it and stuff. And so he's got um, a whole bunch of, of commercial devices like this that he um, has these uh, brand new sensors on them that uh, are these big round, like two inch pancake shaped sensor that picks up. So that one that's going around, the, those old tubes, they, they track mostly <coughs> gamma and a little bit of beta, which is what people are mostly worried about when there's some sort of a nuclear event, because gamma is the stuff that if you get a dose of it, you're dead in like a couple hours or huge blast. And and sort of the, the common thing that, that's said around is is not really to worry about alpha because it can sort of bounce off clothing. It's such like really slow and light. But alpha is actually a really big problem in stuff like this because the, the surrounding areas um, are farms and alpha rains down and falls in the ground and gets some food and if you eat it, um, the things like cesium-137 and these particles look a lot like potassium and things that your body thinks is good. So if you eat them, your body takes them and like sticks them in your bones so that you'll have them for later when you need them. So then you basically start irradiating yourself all the time and, and that's where the really big problems come like 20 years down the line and stuff. And uh, so people in Japan are sort of freaking out because they don't know what's going on. And they just want to know what's going on. They're like anything, any data would be great, but the numbers that are being released are like, here's this one reading from this one city that's 50 kilometers away from where you're at, that was taken three weeks ago, you're, you're fine, don't worry about it. And uh, radiation contained by the minute, by, you know, the, the number here could be normal and over there could be like a super crazy hotspot. Um, so we got a whole bunch of these counters and a whole bunch of, of these tubes that we're building into other counters. And so we've been giving those out to people and then we rigged up uh, some car settings with couple of these outside a car, a couple of these inside a car. We mapped out where all of the schools are within like a 60 or 70 kilometer radius of the evacuation zone, and there's tons of them that are still open and still with, with, kids, uh, with kids playing on them. Um, and so we went and started driving the cars there and walking around in the schools and just tracking numbers and putting them online, just publishing everything as we can. So I'll pass this around too. So this, um, be careful of that back sensor, don't poke anything in it, otherwise it's fairly rugged. So as you can see, like right there, um, the, uh, the CPM, which is sort of counts per minute of, of particles that are flying through through that sensor, there's, a, you know, there's radiation everywhere, so 
don't don't be worried by that. Um, that's uh, <laughs> there's radiation everywhere. Like this, like this is radioactive. Everything's radioactive, and you can you can walk around and see like you know a few a few counts different depending on what what you put on bananas are radioactive and stuff. But so you can see that that's like 20, 20 counts per minute on that. Uh, I was in Portland yesterday and flying back from Portland. It was about 250 counts per minute. Um, I was in Tokyo like two weeks ago and flying from Tokyo to LA is like 800 counts per minute. Um, on a lot of a lot of several of the um, several of the uh, of the like kindergartens and elementary schools that we've gone to, like on the playgrounds, it's like 9,000 counts per minute. <laughs> um, so it's it, it's sort of concerning, um, and the, the parents at these schools don't know that, um, and they're not being told that. So we've got this site set up, uh, which is called SafeCast.org, and um, we're publishing all of the all of the data that we can get from any place, as well as all of the data that we can collect ourselves, and uh, and putting it up there. Um, and the driving around is sort of the stopgap until we get enough devices that we can just hand them out everywhere, and then sort of create this thing, but there's still this problem with those where people have to, we have a we have a little piece of software for smartphones and stuff where people can take a picture of it and then it automatically sends up to like a Flickr account and then OCR is what the reading is and sort of geotags and stuff. So we know barely where it goes, but there's still a little bit of interaction. So we have a, we have a couple, a couple folks um, working on designing our whole new, our own device, which will be based off that same tube that, that measures alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, it'll be a network connected device that'll connect to all sorts of different networks, 3G networks, Wi-Fi networks, on any different com number of, of networks. Um, it'll it's be powered by Arduino. It'll have modular pieces. We can plug other things into it to measure other things beyond radiation if and when we want to. And uh, it'll just automatically upload new readings to our server like every five minutes or something. So. Once we get these things made, which is maybe six or eight months down the line, uh, then we're just going to send them all over the place and people just stick them outside their house someplace and then they'll, uh, they'll report back to us and, and keep track of it. So um, that's kind of what we're doing with it at the moment. And yeah, I don't know. That may have been way too short, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're so how much do these devices cost, and what are you doing to bring prices down? And well, so there's not much you can do to bring prices down because because the, the devices are expensive as hell. So we just we ran a we had we got a couple people who chipped in um, some cash right initially that we were able to like just start doing things with. A lot of people are just kind of like buying things on their own. Um, we just did a Kickstarter uh, campaign and made about thirty seven thousand dollars. I think it ends sometime this afternoon, but we passed our goal, so we're good. Um, that pays for about 150 counters or so. Um, that so that that device that that I'm passing around the, the more made the more made one that's like $800. Um, the, those that sensor just the sensor tube inside it itself from like the plant that manufactures it is like 220 bucks just on its own. Um, so the way the way Geiger tubes work is it, it's a pretty simple thing, but it's it's kind of complex to to design. Is it's it's an almost vacuum filled with like a very specific combination of noble gases that um, both explode and extinguish depending on what particles are flying through them at any given moment. So, and then like a receiver that counts how many little explosions there are that goes through and then you know, calculations after the fact. But maintaining that that sensor device is uh, getting that set up correctly is is kind of pricey. So um, we're we're working on a couple of grants. Um, as well with this. Um, so the team is, um, so the, it's this, the, like I say, it's these, this web shop in Portland called Uncorked, um, and there's a couple guys there. It's not the entire the entire guys, it was just uh, a few of the guys there who sort of jumped on and tackled it with us. Uh, there's me, there's um, Joey Ito, Ray Ozzy, and Dan Synth, who is running this thing. Um, there's a guy named Bunny, who you may have heard of from hacking Xboxes and chumbies and things. He's heading up our hardware piece. And uh, there's a guy, Peter, on the ground in Tokyo who is organizing all the volunteers who are driving around to schools and stuff to track this stuff. And then uh, 
yeah, that's, that's sort of the core team of people who are all, all kind of volunteering to do stuff as, as we can at the moment. Yeah, another one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> has, has anything come of the information that you've been publishing in Japan? Uh, well, there, there has and there hasn't. So um, we've just started publishing stuff in the past few weeks, and um, the Japanese government has made two statements um, which are completely unrelated. It should never be combined at all, but they're two, two independent statements. And the first of which is that there's, there's this thing, it's kind of like a press club um, in, in our, our sort of uh, connotation, but it's a, uh, if you're not a member of the press club, you're not considered actual media and you don't get into press conferences. So you have, like, everybody who's a journalist it joins this thing, and then that's, like, how they're allowed to go to any official press conference or anything. Like, basically, you can't be a journalist if you're not in this in this uh, organization. So the two statements that were made were um, that anybody who reports any um, radiation numbers that are not official will be instantly kicked out of the press clubs. And then the second completely, don't, don't tie these two together, they're, they're separate, is uh, any number that we didn't tell you is not official. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so the so the the press is kind of like hands tied in a whole lot of it. Um, so what we're doing is, is you know we're we're doing it online, and I'm not a part of the Japanese press club, so I don't really care about getting admission to any of that. Um, <coughs> you know, bloggers and people on Twitter and hackerspaces and all of these people are sort of uh, doing what they can to get get the readings out of it. But most of all, it's it's really to try to get stuff to the people in the in the cities around there because radiation is a really kind of scary thing in Japanese culture for obvious reasons. And, uh, and it's invisible, and you just don't know. And, and so people are, are sort of like, I just want to know. Like, if it's good, I want to know. If it's bad, I, want, I just want some answers so that I'm not sitting here just, like, freaking out. Um, and so, you know, when we've been giving these counters to people, like, the first thing they're doing is taking them and, like, sticking them on themselves. Like, that's their immediate, like, first reaction is, like, Am I, am I radioactive? And unfortunately, those things, I mean, that's not the way it works. You need other equipment to find out if, if you're actually screwed or not. But, um, you know, I mean, that, that's kind of like a, a slice of, of the psychology of how, of how concerned and freaked out people are that, like, that's, that's the thing they, they, they want to know is, like, are, have, are they already dead and they just don't know it? So, yeah. I know we all laughed at that statement about Geiger counters in Ohio. Yeah. But it seems sort of implied that perhaps we cannot necessarily trust official numbers, or they may not even exist. So maybe your project implies creating a citizen network of radiation it does. Yeah, I mean, Japan is definitely the sort of start of this. But assuming this all works, and assuming that we don't lose like you know all of our cash that we possibly have doing Japan um, and exhaust any output. We realize that there's a need for this everywhere. There's no, there's no, there's no independent source of radiation data anywhere. And the, the problem is that there's um, counts per minute, there's microsieverts, there's nanosieverts, there's grays. There's like 15 different ways that radiation is tracked, um, and they're not really easy to calculate from one to the other. And so it's a really, really confusing system. Um, and so part of what we want to do, so we want to, we want to get this network. And that's why we're building this device, because it'll be outside of the actual sensor piece as cheap as possible. And then we're going to get, try, we're going to do a little bit of like sort of one laptop per child model, get them out there, get grants to get rid of some of them. One Geiger counter per child. Exactly. But <laughs> sort of sell them. I mean, like lots of different ways to sort of get those out there. And, and once we're actually manufacturing them, we'll be able to sort of deal with a bunch of the costs on that as much as possible. And then, yeah, we'll try to get them everywhere because. That information, though, it's not like that information is everywhere except Japan. Like nobody has has that data. So if we can open that up and, and make that available for anybody, anywhere, then then that's a good thing. And so that that's sort of the plan. Uh, yeah. So I guess my question is hey, about. Can we do um, the wireless for questions so they show up on the? Yeah. Thing? So I don't really know what nine thousand units means. Right. Um, how are you planning to, I guess, educate people about what, how so, the, what, what do those relative numbers mean, and, and you know, where's the lethal cutoff? And right. How does that so, work? so that that's a very, a very important, um, a very important question, and one that I am not qualified or prepared to answer. 
Um, I'm not a nuclear scientist. I'm not a doctor. I don't want to get into. Um, I don't want to get into where I'm making statements that I can't back up because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Like, I can read a measurement and accurately say this says 20. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure that I'm right. You know, that that, that thing actually says 20. But um, what 20 means, what anything else means, I don't know. Um, but a lot of people don't know, and at least knowing some piece that you don't know is better than not knowing anything. And so we want to get that out there, and then we want to point to other people who have made statements on it. So we're sort of collecting universities who have made studies. We have like, okay, this is what the legal limit if you're a nuclear worker in Japan is on a yearly basis. Oh, this is 300 times over that. Probably a concern. I don't know what that means. I, is that is that uh, insurance? It, I don't know. I don't know what what that means specifically. But when when those numbers are being crossed, that's something that people should be aware of. And so then, if we give them the data, then they can sort of make their own decision about how concerning they are or or not or whatever. But at least they have the information and can do research. And we're going to try to provide links to people who have done more research and know what they're doing. But um, I don't want to get into saying some number is safe or not, because I don't know. On the, uh, on the stuff that you guys are building, is there uh, a corollary like, customer app where people in Japan can install an app and they can see what the radiation reported in their area was? By well, working? yeah, so I mean, that, that's on a separate thing. We're working on we're working on a couple different mobile apps for different platforms and all sorts of things that will do that. One will, one will show whatever the most recent stuff is from our map on our site that we've, we've taken in. Um, uh, there's a girl named uh, Haiyan who is the uh, lead data visualization um, at IDEO, and she's doing all of our maps and all of our data and everything. So she's sort of taking all of this crazy amounts of numbers and making it make sense on a map for us. And that should be together very shortly. Um, right now, we just have a whole bunch of Google points, which is a little overwhelming at times. Um, so that should be a little more clear. Um, and then the mobile stuff should, should play into that as well, so you can sort of see where you're at and what's, what's been pulled around you recently. But we're also opening, I mean, we're putting, the, we're putting all of the data, we're publishing it all with a CC0 designation, so it's open for anybody to do anything with at any point. So once it's out there, and starting to be now, um, Anybody can build any apps on top of it, or they can reference it. They can do whatever they want with it as soon as it's out there. So there's nothing stopping anybody else from building those those things at all. But every point of data has, uh, you know, like the actual measurement. That measurement ca like uh, calculated into other common measurements: latitude, longitude, altitude, um, which is something that's that's a, a big issue. So we, you know, we realize that like looking at this. So so here's a good example of that. So me, so this thing. This guy that was being passed around, everybody saw. Um, putting it on here, it goes to 60. Putting it down here, it's at 70, 60, 78. Um, radiation particles are heavy, they fall down. So surfaces are always heavier, like more than, than what's above. Um, the number that it is here is going to be less than, or more than it is up there. So we were able to find out that all the government readings that they're publishing are from um, six meters above the ground. So <laughs> that's very, very different than like you know ground level where kids are playing, which is the, the number that, that we're taking. So um, so that the altitude of where the reading is actually taken is going to be yeah, part of the feed, um, as well as the device that was used, um, the tube, the sensor that's in it. All of these pieces are going to be in our in our data thing that, that everybody can build whatever on top of our reference and cross reference. So you could you can you'll be able to take the feed and say, I don't want any of the readings that came from like Russian salvage stuff. I only want to see stuff that's from these other sensors and then be able to take a look at what that is and then you'll be able to pull in the other pieces and see what, what it looks like with that. So Um, are you publishing your raw data, or just like a service that people can consume? Yeah, we're publishing the raw data. Yeah, we're publishing logs with, with all of it. And then we're creating an API for that that, that you can do everything on top of. But are you publishing that on GitHub? Uh, yeah, we have, Git, we have some GitHub stuff right now. We have, um, the problem is that we have Hackerspace in Tokyo, developers in Portland, all these people, and they all have like their favorite like flavor of, 
of where to publish things and, and all this stuff that, that we're trying to sort of tie together um, with with the majority of the people being volunteer, you know, like saying, don't don't use your favorite thing, use this other thing. People are like, I'm putting on my own thing. And so everybody's kind of doing their pieces and we're putting it together and, and trying to tie that tie that up. But Any other questions? Uh -huh. well,